in the morning and uh, welcome to the last week of the huddle um, many of you may know many of you may not know um, that at the end of March I'm going to transition to a new ministry in Indiana uh, just outside of Indianapolis Indiana um, where I will be uh, continuing on my ministry there and uh, so in the meantime um, uh, the huddles will not uh, be up and continuing as I make that uh, transition. At some point in time, I will probably reintroduce them. They'll not be on Park Christian's uh, site, um, uh, but either on my own uh, Facebook or on Cornerstone's Facebook and uh, Cornerstone's YouTube site. But I'll, I'll put something up eventually for those that have been faithfully following the huddle. And just to start off with, I just want to say a huge, uh, a huge thank you. Um, for the last several years of just following along uh, with these studies and participating in them for your comments and your challenging questions. Um, I've just really, really appreciated it. I've enjoyed um, doing these huddles uh, every weekday morning with you. And it started out as just a, a way to kick off our, our weekday, um, spend a little time in the Word together, huddle up, uh, join together with hearts and minds, and join together in the study of the Word um, before beginning our day and going out on the field of battle to proclaim the name of Jesus. So I've appreciated you um, following along. Some of you have been with us from the very beginning, and I so appreciate that. And I appreciate those that have come on lately uh, and watched the huddles and, and participated in them. It's been a great blessing to me. I hope these have, have helped you uh, through your work day. So this will be our last study of the huddles as we've known it. Um, we'll see what it looks like uh, in the months uh, to come. Um, but just want to remind you that though this will be the last study, um, uh, and we've done this for over three years now, um, although this will be the last study uh, here at, uh, at, at Park Christian, there are many archives for you to go back and revisit um, through um, the, the last three years. Again, I, I, I believe there's over a thousand uh, archives of huddles that you could go back and study through. Um, and uh, those of you that have come on lately, there's again a lot of studies that you would have not seen probably um, that you could go back and study. But just a huge thank you. I've appreciated all of the participation and the support and the encouragement uh, for doing these huddles. And I'll be praying for you as I know that you'll be praying for me as we go through these transitions. But uh, we're going to be in John chapter 11 for this last study uh, where Jesus declares himself resurrection and life. But to begin with, I want to tell one of my favorite stories of an old preacher that was sitting in a restaurant and somebody came up that knew that he was a preacher uh, to challenge him. And this man looked at the preacher and said, you preachers are always talking about uh, the burden of, of sin and the weight of sin. Well, how much does sin weigh? Does it weigh 10 pounds or 80 pounds? Does it weigh 1,000 pounds? How much does the weight of sin weigh? Because I've never felt it. And the preacher very calmly looked up at the man and, and replied to him, well, if I put a ton of weight on a dead man, will the dead man feel it? And the man said, no, of course not. He's dead. And then the preacher replied very profoundly, that of course a spiritually dead man would never feel the weight of sin. But anyone who was being prompted by the Holy Spirit would feel how much the weight of sin is burdensome. And I think that's so true. You know, that, that life, of course, is a, is a basic need of humankind, new life and spiritual life. And, and in this last of Jesus' public beer schools, he demonstrates in a vivid and unforgettable way how he can transfer the dead to life. How he can transition them from not only physical death to physical life, but spiritual death to spiritual life. Just as the healing of the blind man symbolized Jesus' capability to open up our eyes to see that he is the light of the world, and just as the healing of the deaf portrayed that Jesus' power to give uh, understanding, and just as he could make the lame man walk so that we could stand upright in the word of, of, of God and how he can restore 
our ability to walk in righteousness. So the raising of Lazarus from the dead pictures Jesus' ability to give spiritual life to those who are dead in their sin. And so just this morning, um, I just want us to open up our Bibles and uh, we're going to begin uh, in John chapter 11. We're going to really spend our week in John chapter 11 uh, and really the whole chapter. But I, I just kind of want to read through this raising of, of Lazarus. And so let's start at John chapter 11. We'll read verses 1 through uh, 6. Now, a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and, the, and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. So Jesus had a special friendship, a special kinship with Lazarus. He loved him. When he heard this, Jesus said, the sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, yet when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. Then he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. But Rabbi, they said a short while ago, the Jews tried to stone you, and yet you were going back there? And Jesus answered, are, not, are, are there not 12 hours of daylight? A man who walks by day will not stumble, for he sees by the world's light. It is when he walks by night that he stumbles for he has no light. After he had said this, he went on to tell them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to wake him up. And his disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. Jesus had been speaking of Lazarus' death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So when he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and for your sake, I'm glad I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Then Thomas, called Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. And let's just continue on to verse 17. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. And so what, this, what we're going to find is that this miracle of raising Lazarus from the dead um, was not a miracle that was, was prompted by circumstance, but prompted by the intentionality of Jesus to teach a very specific thing about resurrection life. John chapter 11 will mark a significant turning point for Jesus. If you recall, at the end of chapter 10, the Jewish leaders had tried to seize Jesus um, uh, to stone him, and Jesus escaped their grasp and went across the Jordan for a period of time until this appointed time where his death was coming to a close, or where his death was coming close. John chapter 11 marks his return back to the region around Jerusalem and this final journey to the cross. And on the final road to the cross, John 11 and 12 are about death and then life. These events in John chapter 11 have additional special quality for Jesus because they involved a family that he was particularly close to. Bethany was this village just east of Jerusalem over the Mount of Olives, about a half, mile and a half away, and it was here that Lazarus and his two sisters, Mary and Martha, lived. This family had, had been very hospitable to Jesus, opened their home, had fed Jesus and his disciples when they were in this area. It was sort of like... Um, the residence of Jesus while he was in Jerusalem. And they become somewhat like an extended family for Jesus. And Jesus loved them. And, and this is affirmed several times in this chapter, Jesus' love for these three people. Um, Jesus' relationship with this family demonstrates how he developed close relationships. Even though he was God, and even though the cross lay before him, he still needed a community. And he had this with his disciples, but he also had this with this family. He knew he could count on them um, when he needed shelter and, and sustenance and food. And so you, it leads us to wonder what kind of people were Lazarus and Mary and Martha that they were able to have such a close connection to Jesus. You know, Mary, we know, just loved to sit at the foot of Jesus and, and learn from him. Martha, she loved taking care of Jesus. And oftentimes she, she lost the priority of 
of listening to Jesus and just sitting at his feet by just trying to care for him and his disciples and all the busy work there. Lazarus, of course, um, had a close brotherhood uh, with Jesus. And I think it begs the question as we just close today about this family, just something that's not about resurrection and life, but just something practical for us to think about is, is our home and our family a place where Jesus would feel comfortable? Uh, would Jesus want to use our residence as kind of his refuge away from all that was going on in Jerusalem? If, if we had lived in Bethany during this time, would we be a place where Jesus would want to be? Would we be a people that Jesus would want to hang around? Would we have a close connection with Jesus? I think that's, that's a huge question because, you know, now that the Spirit resides within us we can't have fellowship we can't have closeness we can't have intimacy with Jesus um, but is is our life is our person a place where the Holy Spirit dwells in comfort and closeness with us I pray that it is let's just close in prayer this morning Lord God, as we begin this last week of study together, Father, it's just been such a, 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 an awesome time of fellowshipping our hearts and minds in your word. Father, as we think about this family where Jesus would, would often just rest um, from all of the activity around Jerusalem and as he took refuge in their home as the cross lay before him, Father, it begs the question, are we the kind of people that Jesus would want to hang out with? Is our home a place where Jesus can have refuge? And really that leads us to the teaching of Jesus about whether we are the kind of people that the least of these can hang out with. And is our home a place where the least of these can find refuge? Because Jesus clearly said what we've done unto the least of these, his brothers, we've done unto him. Lord, may we be people um, who are clearly in the presence of Jesus, and may our homes be hospitable places where, where people like Jesus, people that need home and shelter and sustenance can be and find comfort and care there. And this is just our humble prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. See you tomorrow. Ready? Praise you.